The Edifice Complex podcast is brought to you by DCM, the drawing specialists, Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software, and Sensor Suite, the future of intelligent buildings. Welcome to the Edifice Complex, the property design and development podcast. Let your hosts, Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean, keep you up with who is innovating and doing great work, perspective on the adjacent possible, and challenges to the status quo. Welcome to the Edifice Complex. I'm Robert Bean, your co-host and unofficial mediator. You're with my colleague, official agitator, friend, and Yoda, most everything to do with buildings, Mr. Adam Muggleton. Say hello, sir, Yoda. Hello, baby Yoda is my new my new mantle now. I love baby Yoda on Mandalorian. Baby Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, today's guests are a Bachelor of Engineering Building Services and a Diploma in Electrical Services from the Dublin Institute of Technology. Right off the bat, two back-to-back uh, practices that fit together and from Dublin, like one of my favorite places in the whole wide world. So already we like them. Um, and he worked his way up through a whole bunch of different uh, engineering companies. Um including one of Adam's owl matters. And uh, so welcome, uh, Owen Hayes. You're a, you're a principal now at EDGE uh, Sustainability Consulting out of Vancouver. And you're doing what we like to call some PCS, which is pretty cool shit in uh, healthcare systems. <laughs> so welcome. We're, it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have you on board. Hey, listen, um, for our student listeners, because that's who we really like to talk to, um, this is how the world works, right, Adam? So young, passionate, edgy, you know, Owen the engineer, right, uh, wants to change the world. So what does he do? He stalks the best people. Like he stalked me. He probably stalked you. He stalks the best people. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's because Adam and I, we stalk the best people. We <laughs> the best people. And he doesn't take no for an answer. That's why we love him. Um, so, yeah, when he wants to bend someone's ear and get the best out, he, he hunts them down, hunts her down. And, uh, and of course, because he's Irish, if you're going to meet him anywhere, right, Adam, you meet him in a pub. Tell him, that's, obviously. <laughs> that's just, <laughs> the stereotype <laughs> is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I actually didn't know that Adam and Owen know each other. By the way, Owen spelled with a really good Gaelic spelling, E-O-G-H-A-N. Right, I mean, it's yeah, that's right. People, yeah, most people would never get Egon, that. Egon, Johan, I've been called all sorts. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not. It wasn't a surprise when Adam told me that the two of you guys knew each other when I was when we were when I was stalking Owen to get him to come. Up. Well, actually, you stalked me, and I said, "I stalked you." Morning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should get you yeah. on the show. So we did. And you know what? But STEM students, they, you know, I don't know if there's lots of people that need to hear some stories, but the STEM students listening to our show really need to hear yours because it's pretty cool. So tell them. What's, what's up, Owen? Thank you very story. much, Robert and, and Adam. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, just thanks for having me on the show. It's great to, great to be on here and chat to two legends in the industry and setting up such a great podcast to, you know, students that are coming into the industry and give them a good heads up as to, as to what's going on. So uh, as you mentioned, I went to Dublin Institute of Technology, studied electrical engineering for three years and uh, then transferred into mechanical building services. So um, I understand that colleges and universities here, they don't uh, do specific engineering as it relates to a certain discipline. It's kind of generic. Uh, whereas, you know, back home in Ireland and the UK, uh, after year or two, we specialize in a discipline. So uh, that's specific to a trade. So in, in our university, it was mechanical engineering, mechanical building services are structural. So uh, I chose mechanical building services because, you know, buildings are super interesting, want to um, make an impact there. And uh, that program was, was excellent. Um, actually, one of your former uh, hosts on this show are, uh, was uh, Peter Simmons. He actually knows one of my lecturers, uh, Ken Beattie. Uh, okay. who was a big big advocate of um, some software that we were using uh, as part of building services, uh, which is IESVE, which is a software um, for energy simulation um, developed by a guy called Dr. Don McLean out of Glasgow. And uh, so he was, uh, my bar lecturer, Ken Beatty, studied um, at uh, DIT, there was a lecture there as well. And he studied in the UK and met all these great folks in the UK, including uh, 
Don McLean and, and Peter, and they're, they're apparently buddies. Uh, he brought kind of energy modeling into uh, the building services program at, uh, at, the, at, our, at our course. And it was a, immediately a bit of conflict because, between the lecturers because you had certain lecturers that didn't want to hear anything about energy modeling. It was all Excel. It was all manual calculations. They did not particularly find energy modeling um, you know, something that you think you should do because a very old school way of approaching building design. Like we had uh, cooling load calculations with like four spreadsheets long just to get the peak dry result and temperature in a room looking at the sol air tables of the Simsy guide. So, uh, so as part of our thesis, our, our, our final year project, we would have to, we do an, an energy model and have our full mechanical design for, for a building. And in my case, it was an office. But you had to have everything that you had in the energy model backed up with these spreadsheets and these calculations uh, because they just didn't trust it and wanted to make sure that uh, that the software, what the software was giving you was uh, was was accurate. So, um, you know, if I graduated in 2005 and worked back home for a year and a half and uh, worked with some really good architects. I, I didn't know they were good architects at the time. They're actually world-renowned Grafton architects. So we did like a, a house um, 10 Clyde Lane with uh, Yvonne Farrell there and uh, just amazing architect to, to work with. Um, there was an elevator put in this house and the guy from ThyssenKrupp was on the on site and uh, she was on site, uh, Yvonne was, and she's like, I want wood panels in the elevator. And, uh, you know, on site and the guy from ThyssenKrupp goes, we don't do wood panels in the elevators. You're not getting a wood panel in there. And she's like, we're grafting architects. Put a wood panel in the elevator. And, you know, and, you know, just, just like just like walked off. This is like having none of it. It's like just forget about it. You know. Uh, so they got they won World Architect of the our, their project won World Architect of the Year in two thousand eight for Bocconi University, I believe. So, oh, wow. um, but yeah, like really, I, as I said, we were just doing a a, a small little house ten Clyde Lane together, and you know, just a great architect to work with. So. And they do really good work. So um, after a year and a half at home, I was like, oh, I want to go traveling. You know, you finished university after spending five years. And so my buddies that uh, I used to do J1s uh, to Boston. So in, in Ireland, we have this J1 visa where you can go to the States while you're studying in university. So from yeah. June to September. So like the weather back home is not the best. So we're like, no point staying around here for, for, for the summer. So uh, yeah, we spent like three summers uh, in an island off the coast of Boston called uh, Nantucket. Uh, yeah. So like really good friends there. And uh, I've got family there as well, actually. Um, so yeah, those buddies that I went traveling with were like, let's go to Vancouver. Because at the time... But oh, um, hang on a second, hang on. People need to understand that Irish people have relatives absolutely everywhere, everywhere. because yeah. because there's more people living outside of ireland irish living outside right. of ireland only, right oh so, yeah that, that's right yeah yeah, yeah, it, yeah it's brilliant yeah it's it's good <laughs> <laughs> i know relatives in vancouver though it's just we, really? we, we tend to stay around the east coast area we, uh, we yeah. it was a long enough journey for us to to come across <laughs> the atlantic that we're like okay we're just gonna stop here yeah, you know yeah. that's why you have newfoundland yeah. you're like all right this is this is good enough. Across that's, because, the ocean. that's because the beer was up to your standard. You said, well, this good beer, good area. We don't need to go any further. No, no, exactly. <laughs> we we so, have everything we need here. West Coast, we're a bit lonely, Robert. You know, we need to, we need to, we need to bring them out more over this side, you know. Um, but, yeah, like th th those guys we went traveling with, like everyone, there was a mass exodus in 2007 from... 2006, 2007, from Ireland to Australia. Uh, and we're like, I'm not going to Australia because yeah. my whole road that I was living on at the time back home, they, they literally went to Australia. I'm like, there's no point in going to Australia and hanging out with all the footies that you grew up with. <laughs> Let's go somewhere different. So uh, I came here in 2006, December, and I uh, got the job with, um, with Cobalt, now Integral Group. And that's where I met Adam and um, started my kind of Canadian engineering career, which uh, has been a roller coaster, I suppose, ever since, you know? So from getting off the plane thinking, oh, Canada's on the metric system, to getting into Cobalt <laughs> thinking, 
what the hell is this? <laughs> right? It's the worst place in the world to do engineering because it's not on the imperial system. It's not on the metric system. It's on both. So uh, yeah, we didn't know what a CFM was. You know, what's this BTU hour malarkey? And, you know, because <laughs> like, uh, we're so close to the States. So, yeah, that was a bit of a bit of a bit of a learning curve. Um, but great, great experience. Worked with some really top notch engineers there and worked on some really great projects. And after um, oh, four years with those guys, um, the leader of that company left and I went to join him. Um, working for a company called Phoenix doing retrofits of existing buildings which was completely different to working on new builds like you know it, when you're at a, at a consultancy churning out drawings mechanical drawings and uh, I was doing energy modeling there at the time as well which is kind of unique because they had a separate energy modeling team which was separate to design which I never got like these were the uh, simulation jockeys I think uh, Peter referred to yeah, that's like, awesome. <laughs> so yeah. they had a simulation jockey team um, in there on a, a separate electrical team, separate mechanical team. But for all the projects that I worked on uh, while I was at Cobalt, uh, I always did my own modeling and yeah. did my own lead models in tandem with the design because I already knew IES. So I got, we convinced Cobalt to buy uh, IES at the time. Uh, and we just started using that and it, re it was really a benefit. So we're not just using energy modeling as a tick the box exercise or yeah, you pass lead or you pass ashtray, who cares? You're actually doing your loads in it uh, incorporating your mechanical systems in there. And you just get to realize that there's a lot of things that we do mechanically that had they, have they had the software, if they were in front of that software and knew the software and the design, that would make them a lot better designers Absolutely. Than what do, you know and yeah. vice versa with energy modelers so kind of what happens now is energy modelers come out of university or and be like oh, i'll go straight into energy modeling and adam will kind of attest to this like you'll see like junior engineers sitting in front of like isve which is you know the most complicated building yeah. simulation software in the world and they have no business sitting in front of ISV, <laughs> like no design experience like whatsoever like that yeah. software, you can literally go in and draw your HVAC system, every coil, every fan, every controller, and you need to know your control sequence of operation. You need to know under engineering, you need to know sizing, you need to know um, how fans operate. You need to know basically everything about the design of a building, really to utilize that software, which students that come out of university, you just can't have that. You need to have the, the design with the modeling, you know? So, um, yeah, it always, it always baffled me that uh, that modelers didn't understand design and then designers didn't understand modeling and really they should be kind of two and the same. So yeah, if a modeler yeah. came to a designer or a mechanical engineer saying, oh, let's put the face, it's faster to face in PV panels. And the designer would be like, oh, okay, nut job, go away. You don't know how to make this. <laughs> they, they wouldn't listen to them. You're just like, oh, yeah, just... Yeah. Yeah, go away there energy modeler run your yeah. simulation you know and yeah, yeah and th that's that's still the kind of the case today you know you got certain softwares that are doe based and yeah you can there's literally a, download them for free and just click the buttons and yeah you got an energy model you know yeah one of the legends really in the world is a guy by the name of uh, dr mark bomberg and he was a he was a yeah i mean he was a building scientist building scientist and he taught at the university of saskatchewan and he was very, very strict about computers. And he would say, you do not touch the computer until you know the answer. The computer is just there to run the numbers for you. But you, if you're using the computer to give you the answers, you're dangerous. That, and that was his belief. And, he, and that's so, so true. And I always, and Adam, we've talked about this before, you know, we adopted that philosophy because when we would hire engineers out of, you know, different universities and all of their colleagues, just like you were saying, oh, and they would get my, my, my competitors, you know, they were all teaching these kids how to run the software. And when they came into our office, they were, they were in for a shock because they got a pencil and a piece of, and a graph paper and a calculator, but they didn't have one and most of them had it, but that's what their tools were. And then the ASHRAE handbooks and then our, and then our own stuff, right? And for like six, seven months, whatever it was, they did hand calculations. Day after day, hour after hour, all they did was that freaking piece of paper and their hand calculator and a pencil crunching the numbers. And they became 
the best engineers, you know? Yeah, it, and it, it's, it's so yeah. important. Yeah, it is. It's, it's so important. Like, um, and, you know, going back, the, the software is just a tool. And if you don't know how to use a tool, then, um, you know, it's not going to work out very well. Like, I can go up to home hardware now and buy the best hammer in the world. That doesn't make me a carpenter, right? So that's the same with, uh, with software, right? So yeah. uh, it literally is just a tool. And if, you don't, if you're not trained in it, if you don't know what it's supposed to do, if you don't know what things look like, um, you know, we have graphics that we do on mechanical systems before we start modeling to make yeah. sure that, you know, we understand fully the, the systems that are being proposed by mechanical and um, by the team. And then also to kind of, you know, give a visual representation of what it is you're simulating as well. Because, you know, kind of similar even to design and not going out to site and seeing what a fan coil looks like or uh, what an AHU looks like. It's the same with the, with the simulation world, except you're one step removed. You don't even know what the design looks like on a drawing. <laughs> you're yeah. just clicking buttons through, a, through software, right? So... Um, yeah, there's definitely a couple of gaps that need to be bridged uh, as it relates to energy modeling and design, and um, it, both can no, help, each, help each other out, you know? Yeah, it's no different than the drone jockeys, you know, dropping missiles and, yeah, sure. you know, yeah. The, coll oh, yeah. the, the collateral damage. When you get somebody that's on the ground, you know, duking it out, those are two different soldiers, right? It's oh, definitely. Thing. Yeah. One's playing thing. Call of Duty in a, in yeah. a seat can, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally, yeah. it's, it's what they're doing. And then the other one's on the ground fighting. And it's and the, it, there's no um, yeah. kind of impact or reality to what it is that they're doing. And that's the same kind of with the, the modeling world as well. It's like, oh, my model says. But, you know, if, if you do a model properly and you understand the design, that... Um, software and that model becomes way more powerful than you in initially anticipated in yeah. that you can now use it for commissioning you can now use it for m and v yeah. uh, you can now use it to troubleshoot and um make the building better over time and that's kind of what we're seeing with digital twins coming on the market now like the yeah, ies are doing are pretty serious about digital twins and it's literally going to be you're going to have this digital representation of the building continuously calibrated and been updated all the time such that you're able to identify errors uh, or things that are not operating as per the design and things that you can tweak right like hey what's going to happen if i change this set point here like yeah, change the optimization. It. yeah yeah it, and it's massive like i've deleted heating coils from air handling units in offices because of modeling because i'm like hey i've got heat recovery i'm only heating that air up to 12 the heat recovery is at 70% efficient, minus nine outside or 15F. There's no heating coil required here because I'm only heating the air up to actually 7C. Delete the heating coil. It, the heat, heat recovery is not going to, there's no moving parts in it. It was a refrigerant heat pipe. Like, what do you need the heating coil for? Just get rid of it. It's right. not there. Uh, you know? So that's the, I, in so many ways I want to jump in here. So first things first, for me, you're like a living Venn diagram, like design engineer, <laughs> software jockey, Meets has child, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, starting from university, yeah, you're right. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. your career was as had an interest in art, right? You sort of arrived just as sort of energy modeling was starting to become mainstream. And back in the days when we worked together at Cobalt, initially, energy modeling and Cobalt, we were using it for lead compliance and compliance modeling, right? So it made a little bit of sense that they were this little gang in the corner. But, you know, and I, I was in meetings with one of them and they're like trying to tell these senior people like, no, that don't work. And I'm thinking, you're a year out of university, just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but then it sort of changed again, right? And, and the software, I, I can't in oh, yes, the yeah. environment, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that's the one that made the difference because that started to become a useful design tool, right? But then, as you know, you can't be a software jockey at that point. You got to be a designer first, in my opinion, who yeah. uses that as a tool. Otherwise, it's like buying a lathe and saying, "Build me a, a sofa, bitch!" Right? It's just not going to work. Right? No, no, definitely not. But, yeah. But to your point there about the deleting the heating coil, right? So, I've always one of my pet. Bet Noirs is, you know, why is there no innovation in our business? And one of the reasons is 
you do not get sued for following ashtray guides and sipsy guides, right? Because if the shit hits the fan, you stand up in court and you go, page yep. four, table five says, right? Now, if you're in that same situation, say, oh, well, I did my virtual environment model and it told me I could delete that. And I go, and the other lawyer who will have a barrister the si with a brain the size of a freaking Australia will go, and what page is that in the Sibsy guide then? I mean, and you'll be going, ah, da, 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 da. And that'll be a wrap. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, it, it would be a, yeah. a manual calc as well, right? So, like, yeah. the software will tell you one part, but, like, you don't trust the software. I never trust software. Yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. talking yeah. like an engineer. And that's from my, that's from my yeah. lecture. That's from my yeah. lecture. That goes back to my university days. Where, like, yeah. Hey, just because the software says something, uh, and this is what IES offers you, is transparency. So I can go into that coil, find out what the on-coil temperature is, leaving coil temperature is, follow the air flows, and then you get the pen and the bit of paper out, and you, you manually check it, and you're like, oh, yeah. okay, yeah, the 45, you know, coming in, and I only have to hit 45, 15.8 uh, coming in, and coming back at 70, do that. Oh, I'm above 45. This coil will never run. If it was a heat wheel, I'd keep that uh, that heat coil in there. But when it's a refrigerant heat pipe with no moving parts, you're like, ah, you can get rid of that. And then that coil is never going to turn on or never needs to turn on because it makes you a four pipe fan coil system. And then by default, by omitting that, you've saved cost, you've saved yeah. operational cost, and Maybe. you've been build more efficient. And yeah, that's it. It's just like, okay, don't need it. You know? It's bigger than that, right? So yeah. nine out of 10 engineers would put that coil in and walk away and know no one was going to come and sue them, right? But the engineer that engineers the job, and this is the point we're talking about here, is engineering the job, right? You've done that, you've backed it up with calculation, but think of the 25-year life cycle money you've saved. Materials, yeah, right. running cost, you know, on and on, maintenance cost. It's a freaking huge number. Yeah. And this yeah. where <laughs> I think the next evolution of doing the sort of engineering, what I call design engineering, right? You're doing is selling that benefit. I can eliminate this with confidence because yeah. I know this works and this is why. I'm not just a software jockey who's done a two day course. And this is why, but also you need to be able to say, and over a 25 year lifespan of this building, I've just saved you, I don't know, $500,000. Yeah, that's true. But that's the part that we would be we don't promote ourselves enough yeah. um, in that regard, right? To, to that point is like multiplying these numbers by that, that lifespan. And then what could go wrong? Like if you have that heating coil on in that unit, what's going to happen? You're going to add more cooling. It's going to use more heat, but no one's going to be impacted thermally on it. So you could just have that running forever and you won't even realize yeah. that, it's, that it's running. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like, okay. And someone does an audit and you're like, Oh yeah, you can delete this coil. And, so on and so yeah. forth. So, yeah, there's, a like big, there's a there's a big message in here, and that is is that we've talked about this before on the shows that, and I don't again I don't have the, the exact numbers I can't remember them because I'm getting old. But it's something like sixty percent of all the buildings in North America are under twenty five thousand square feet, which means there's no re requirement for mechanical engineering. Most of these done are designs are done by people at, in the trade level or the wholesale or distribution level that don't have a secondary science and engineering. So these kinds of, like the coil example, that exists all over our country. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we're talking about, look, talking about life cycles costs on one coil. Just imagine the economic and resource wastes that are in our buildings all over this continent. It's absolutely insane. If we were running a company that way, we would be fired. The shareholders would grab us by the neck and they would say, you're gone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but to, no, to Adam's point though, does that, the, the, to Adam's point about getting sued though, that's uh, that's that's kind of what they're afraid of, right? Because they're designing for the worst case scenario. Like I went out to a um, a union in Vegas, and they had a whole building with like three, I think they were like fifteen hundred ton chillers that never ran. <laughs> it was a part of like they these chillers are in there for the past five or six years i think they had less than 100 run errors in each one the place was pristine like lovely well lit and i was like yeah these chillers never run i'm like what <laughs> yeah, it was just like just in case you know <laughs> oh, like, what this is a whole room full of chillers that like are just in case stay you know vegas gets a little bit warmer one day and 
uh, or uh, another trailer plant, or plant shuts down, and you're like, Who but that's the problem, right? The incentives are all misaligned. There's no incentive yeah. to do what you're doing, which is proper engineering and right sizing, because there's there's no reward for that, other than a possible lawsuit and a fucking you no know, six months of your life, and you you'll probably come out the other end okay, minus the fees to the lawyer and the stress and the grey hair, right? Whereas if you just do the bullshit yeah. rule of thumb stuff, you get the pat on the back and the next job. It yeah. just I, sucks. It might shift though, Adam, I think, because of performance based targets. And I know we're a little bit slow, to, slow yeah. to the game on that. Like yeah. Seattle has reporting on all their buildings and um, we can get energy data from them. They've got some great um, resources there. You can download like live data because they mandated it as part of their codes years ago, which is been brilliant because you have all this great data on yeah. all these different building demographics and we have been slow to to the game on that we still don't have it yet and i've been banging my head on the table for this uh, and speaking to the guys at the provincial and kind of city level i was like um especially as it relates to you know the new codes with teddy and tui targets yeah. i'm like no we need data otherwise what what happened with the step code in my opinion, is you, you got these guys, many envelope consultants, that uh, was actually one envelope consultant company that just said, okay, this is the way to do it. They, we want to do a better envelope. So Vancouver went from 90% glass buildings to now we're going to 20 or 15% glass buildings. And that doesn't make sense either. You know, like they're kind of so in, 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 in between. But without, right. that, without that data that Seattle has, and hopefully they're leveraging some of that data, we're we're going to get burned and we're going to go down the wrong path we kind of tend to as an industry sway to extreme so we had our lead uh so everyone's on the lead bandwagon and we're like oh this is the best thing ever when especially uh, when i started working with with yourself adam back in 2007 that was the big kind of train that everyone was on and yeah, then on, that passive house. yeah it's like yeah it's a, it's all passive house now so uh, that's kind of the new trade which is kind of ironic because the buildings we built back then were glass boxes and you know we put we grow tomatoes in glass boxes back home adam you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we don't put people in them so uh, yeah. and now it's gone to you know basically we're designing prison like buildings like yeah. like there was, there was one project i was working on uh like the architect sent me through the drawings and we drew it up in ies and i was like oh, is this right and i checked it and i sent it off to one of the guys and i'm like 12 percent glass and I, I just emailed the back i was like nice prison so the balance is i think uh, is is in between but uh, going back to the original thing about data if you don't have that data you make bad decisions or you get um someone running all these simulations parametric modeling which is a pet peeve of yeah. mine where they run you know ten thousand simulations on one building and they're like, oh, look at all this great work we did. And we did it in like, you know, five minutes or whatever. I'm like, if you're running 10,000 simulations on a building, you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. No one has the time to QC 10,000 simulations, you know? So yeah. the most important simulation is the first simulation. Um, and then you kind of go from there and build on top of that first simulation because that tells you all the kind of data you need. But um as I said about the, the measurement and verification data that Seattle have, like we need that for the step code buildings. And, you know, step code has been around for three or four years now, and I'm still trying to, you know, get data, even from some of the projects we've worked on, we're slowly getting there to see if these buildings are actually performing because the expectation is that we're going to hit these EUI targets uh, yeah. that we can measure the GHGI targets we can measure and the Teddy target. We can't measure that because it's just heat delivered into the building unless it's submetered in some way, which most of these buildings are not. So, um, without that data, we're kind of designing blind, really. And all that's going to happen is we're hopefully it'll work out. But if it doesn't work out, we're like, oh, well, that didn't work out. And it was because of these guys that, that it didn't work out. Uh, so we'll just use that as an excuse. And then we still don't have the data. So another company will come along. It's like, I have an idea. Let's make it about this. And then we're going to have another building code that's going to focus but again they don't have that crucial thing which I'm is the day triggered here I'm <laughs> <laughs> but you know what given but you have to give credit to um, BC housing and you know because they have basically almost replaced uh, IRC NRC in Ottawa you know and the amount of research work that they've supported and the documentation and I and 
going back to your point about going from, you know, whatever, 80 to 90% glass down to 12%, you know, we have been working with them to understand that integrated design should drive the glass area. Yeah. Because yeah. you have to have a proper amount of lighting. You have to have the control over the thermal comfort from the mean radiant temperature. But there's yeah. also an element of outgassing, you know, from shortwave radiation hitting any way yes. uh, material. So it's related to air quality, it's related to thermal comfort, and it's related to lighting. So the integrated design is something that we, all of us, need to work with these people that are writing these kinds of standards. So we don't get the prism, but we don't get the aquarium either, right? Somewhere the body will tell us when we get it right. So yeah, to give, exactly. yeah. Sorry, to give a shout out to my old partner, Goran Ostrich. He always used to say to me, Adam, 45 to 55% is the sweet spot on glazing. Yeah. 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 It, it leaves you open to options on like lead gold and platinum certification, which at the time was a big deal, you know, but it also means you can live in it and not feel like you want to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. 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 See, circadian rhythm is really important, right? Especially, <laughs> especially here, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like Robert, to your point there, like, yeah, we work with BC Housing as well. They, they're a, a good client. And I think you've yeah. got, the, you've got that more holistic mindset about, you know, um, healthy, smart, smart, sustainable. That's our, our three yeah. kind of mottos because you have to have a healthy building. Anyone can design an energy efficient building that is right. terrible for occupancy health. All you need to do is throttle back the indoor or the, the outside air and you've got this terrible building or go to 10% glass. Yeah, it's like, yeah, great right. building, your buddy, but <laughs> <laughs> it's very efficient, but you just can't live in it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so that's, you, need, you, need that, you need that balance, and that's kind of where I, see, I don't want to see the industry going down that path, and I think it is a little bit where you're just looking at a Teddy target and, yeah. uh, or a TUI target and a GHGI, but you're not factoring in indoor air quality, which um, by nature of design isn't now in the teddy target so with the teddy target you're not incentivized to save on lighting because you're getting credit for your teddy target by having terrible inefficient lighting because that's helping your heating load and yeah. same ventilation so they think you know designers are doing well ventilation uh, design is the same as ventilation operations so they're actually designing to code minimums like bare bare code minimums for ventilation rate so what's happening now is we've got these super airtight buildings with a really good envelope with minimum code ventilation rates, uh, we don't want lighting savings, and they they don't want yeah, a lot of glass, and they don't want balconies. That's the other thing as well. So we've been in in meetings with uh, some on high rise residential buildings, and the envelope consultants there is like delete the balconies off the building because uh, of thermal origin. And you're like, what? What? <laughs> are you? And the developer's like, are you mental? <laughs> like, yeah, what are you talking about? Delete the balconies off my building. I was like, I don't have less money that we'll get for our, our parents. And that's an outdoor space. You know, you're in a high rise yeah. building, you need yeah. that kind of connection or some sort of connection with outdoors. Like, to, be it yeah. like your dog is annoying you or your wife is annoying you or you just need somewhere to go read a book or whatever it is. But you need to have that connection, you know? Yeah. You know what? I worked on a job in Ottawa. It was supposed to be a lead platinum. One of the last jobs I did for Cobalt went. And it was supposed to be lead platinum residential. It could be the first lead platinum residential, blah, 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 blah. Then it got down to thermal bridging, right? So these were going to be, let's not make no mistake, these were going to be high end apartments, right? I bought one, I sold it in the end, right? And there was a discussion about thermal bridging, right? So you needed thermal bridging to make the model work. And basically to stop people getting cold feet because also yeah, it, makes, it, makes, it makes sense right? yeah. yeah and then the cost guy arrived and the developer arrived and that conversation just went downhill man and there was no thermal bridging so basically you were paying like god knows how many millions for the penthouse and you were sitting near that window and freezing your ass off yeah if people, you know for, for listeners listening if you want a good example of thermal bridging just google the aqua tower in chicago yeah. And, you know, they've got, uh, you know, our, the, the standard architectural photographs and then right next to it, the thermographic images. And it's, it's embarrassing. That building and the architects won so many awards before the thing was finished. And I was in Chicago three, four times during construction. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm looking at those fins because that's what they are. They're fins. Yeah. And I'm going, this is a freaking disaster. Every floor that that thing goes up the same way is just another story to tell about how bad that building's going to be, right? 41 million BTUs per hour that thing runs at in the middle of winter. 
right? Cranking out while at the flame, flame temperature. We've talked about actually before, right? 3,400 degrees, 41 million BTUs, and all those people are freezing their ass off. Yep. There's no winner in that situation, it, it, right? Nobody wins. Yeah, no. it, it is, yeah. Like they, they should, in certain climates, like cold climates, it's a no-brainer. They should just yeah. be doing this, we, we know. Um, in our climate, it's a bit, I would say, harder to justify. Uh, average outside our temperature here is 50 degrees F or 10 degrees C. Yeah, yeah right? so Vancouver's right. temperate, yeah. right? Rob, yeah. Robert's in zero. You, I, average temperature 32 degrees F, right? So, so no, dude, dude. So, we're get, yeah. We get to minus, we get down to minus 40. I, you know, that's without the wind chill. I mean, that's for minus 40 is our. No. I, mean, I think our design temperature here is like as it's like minus 32. But I, I toss the asteroid data out because I know my clients are going to have buildings that have minus 40 operations. <laughs> yeah, you need. It, it's just a no-brainer for those type of climates that you should be yeah. doing it. And, you know, we did a, yeah, but yeah, have to. Should, you, know. Right? you know, it's the old should. I should be a billionaire. I should be married to Beyonce, right? Should, <laughs> should, should, right? But I want to talk about data because I got into a Twitter war this week with someone from the Well Institute. So someone put up from the Smart Building Academy on LinkedIn, you know, what is the smart certification you should have? Your career and my answer was none it should all should be done on open source data and um and performance yeah so well that triggered this like <laughs> i think i seen that tweet i was like jesus adam <laughs> you rebel you shift the server the whole thing was you know well well she's right well's intentions are good right it's like leads intentions are good and well's the new lead i guess but are you called the building whisperer by the way <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, quiet, nothing quiet about that. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like that, that red cup of tea that bursts through the door and goes, ah. <laughs> My point was, unless you open source all this performance data, you cannot benchmark and you cannot set KPIs, right? This no. data needs to be massively open source and local jurisdictions could do this with a stroke of a pen. Yeah, easily, Adam. That's what we wanted them to do, right? It's like you can't renew your um, your business license unless you give them your utility data. Yeah. And that's what I was kind of pushing or advocating for. You have to have this mandatory report because if we don't have the data, to your point, we can't impact the future. Otherwise, we're guessing, right? So right. Yeah, you're yeah. just another person with an opinion. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> one of the, 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 the famous quotes. Uh, I can't remember the guy that said that, a Canadian lad. Uh, but yeah, like if, if we don't have the data, then we're just guessing, you know? And th that's kind of the same with energy model. I think energy model is equivalent to data, but it's not as good as data. It's just like it taking it to that level where it's not, it's bridging that design to a climate and to a particular set of controls. But the ultimate data that we really strive for is, you know, measured data. And then the integrity of that measure data has to be verified as well, because as you know, Adam, like you'll have BTU meters that don't have turbines that are flowing properly, and that can give you false data. And yeah, as my answer, in on site, in real time, please. Yeah, exactly. And like you have to verify that as well. So because there's a lot of there's another generation of companies that are coming online now where they're piggybacking the data that you get from a DDC or a BMS system, yeah. putting it into these fancy graphs. And yeah. kind of doing like heat and degree dynamics. So like, oh, you could save this much energy, but they don't even know what the system looks like, how it's designed, how it's operating. So they'll give you all these advice, but like they could shut down something that's not supposed to be, uh, that's, that's running, that is supposed to run 24 seven or make these decisions. But, um, so, and that's kind of where the tech is coming in over top of these BMS systems and kind of doing something similar to uh, energy optimization, I suppose is what you call it. But um, a lot of them, maybe wouldn't have the necessary details that you need in order to, to do that. You know? uh, you've just described perfectly accurately the energy service, the energy the ESCO model, right? I come yeah. in, I harvest data or trend data from your BMS. I send you a load of, what, what does Peter Simmons call it? Uh, colors for directors pictures, you know, loads yes, of graphs. Yes. <laughs> you do a good job. Those graphs are nice. <laughs> 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 You get down the bottom, uh, buy my new chiller, turn off the other chiller, give me the money. <laughs> yeah. And they're not cheap. Like, the, we had one quote for 60 grand, 65 grand a year, and 
okay, what are you, what are you actually doing here? Um, and you know, as a healthcare building as well. So like, there's certain buildings you can kind of um, mess around with, and there's certain buildings you can't. And healthcare is definitely one where you need to know what you're doing when you're tweaking a healthcare building. You know? The edifice complex will continue in just a moment. Can you find the drawing and supporting documents you need in less than a minute? Now you can with Echo. It's simple. Just type what you're looking for and press enter. Echo knows your building. Speak with a drawing specialist today. Ask about our special offer of painless onboarding plus six months free with Echo. Visit podcast.thedsoffer.com. That's podcast.thedsoffer.com. And now back to the show. Now, because I like you and I know you, because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit anti-energy modeling normally, right? Because nine out of 10, no, eight out of 10 people, energy modelers I meet are software jockeys. They've done the course and you know, they don't know which way up the handling unit goes, but that don't matter, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But the, the evolution and growth in your career, and I'm going to describe your career at the end for any young people who listen to this, because there's a, there's a great story there. But the evolution of your career is taking your skills, which are great design skills, and then applying that to an existing building. Let's take a hospital, for example, right? Yep. And optimizing that, right? Because you know enough to know when you're getting smoke blown up your leg, right? And it's BS. <laughs> But, yeah, you know, the, the data comes in, but you still need that experienced brain to yeah. sort the wheat from the chaff and then say, these are the things we can optimize, right? Because just by soft consulting, I take that data and analyzing it, changing some set points, rescheduling outside air, rescheduling plant, you can save a ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> And then yeah. locking down the set points so that no one can change them. That's the key. Password, everything after that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that, that's what happens. Like, um, they're putting the overrides in. Like, you'll go and fix something. Uh, this is why you need ongoing, I'd say, measurement verification. And yes. to your point, Adam, like, we've done measurement verification on a healthcare facility. Um, this is what Robert and I originally spoke about. Um, and we've had great success because we actually implemented the plan and not only do we implement the plan, because that like this is what happens. You you M and V is probably the most powerful lead credit. It's the one credit that always gets dropped. And most buildings don't implement it because the cost's not there. But with a healthcare building, when you've got an operating budget of or utility budget of two million dollars a year that they're spending, and you know, fan energy is four hundred and fifty grand of that, yeah. um, then it becomes, oh, well, now it's a financial conversation. We should put in these meters, but um, but no one adds fee to go back and stay with the project so uh, with edge you know the stuff that we're kind of buildings that we're working on now where they're kind of healthcare based we always tell our clients we're the first ones on site and we never leave and the reason we never leave is because energy is so expensive for those facilities it makes sense for us to do a monthly report on that energy and then recommend tweaks to your point adam on certain things or if something goes astray you're hearing about it you know, after one month, not after a year where you're like, right. hey, how, do, how did we just spend an extra 400 grand this year on energy? Oh, and then yeah. where, where did that energy go? Like, if you don't have the metering, then you don't know, oh, yeah. was that the chiller? Was that the pumps? Was that the fans? Like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you yeah, don't yeah. Data, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's say Edge have set the building up, you've tuned it, you know, you got the MV set up, then you can... A trend line and alarm the points you know as an engineer matter right and then when they go out of range that's an intervention point right yeah you come in yeah. and you prevent a massive utility bill six months down the line <laughs> yeah that's it I, and you, you, we've asked for those alarms well yeah. you know yourself any ddc or bms system you go into adam what what's the always thing you see down at the bottom left hand side it's always locked and, off 10,000 alarms. I was like, yeah. this oh, is no. <laughs> so, <laughs> There definitely needs to be, uh, I suppose, different levels of alarm to your point. And, you know, if we could get an independent uh, alert that would, you know, trigger those, those set points that you mentioned. There's two things I always do on a job. I try and lock down set points with a password and I put consequential alarms on by email. So, even so, anything I'm, I'm uptight about, I try and set an email alert up to somewhere. 
but yeah. I come back a year later, everything's muted, the emails are deleted. <laughs> it's like... That's it. You, you kind of need to, I call it energy babysitting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really what, what it is, right? But yeah. it's, I think it's definitely worth it. Well, it doesn't take that long to do. Like if you're familiar with the building, you know, a, an hour, a month is not too bad. And you can kind of teach, you know, someone, okay, here's how you process the data. And you can have the data presented in such a way to yourself that you'll know if something's wrong or you know if something's off. And, you know, exterior lighting, for example, was really high one month. And, you know, one of the photo cells was broken. And you're like, okay, well, that, you know, it's an, that's an easy fix, you know? Or um, they shut off a heat recovery coil. We found out about that pretty quick because it was a massive heat recovery coil serving the whole hospital um, that they actually shut off manually. So the DDC guy actually took it off the DDC graphic because he didn't want <laughs> someone to actually or, So someone actually went up and like basically turned off the coil. Uh, and just other things uh, that you mentioned as, as well, Adam, like um, m and I think is, is something that is very powerful and something that we've learned a lot from. It kind of completes the circle of design and energy modeling as well, right? The, yeah, because it's, it's ongoing. You get feedback from you know, what you did, how you designed it, um, how you modeled it, how you simulated it. And it's kind of, you're using, uh, as I mentioned before, the model to kind of diagnose issues with the building. But if you build a crap model that means nothing, that doesn't represent fan energy or pump energy or so forth, then you can't leverage that data that you've built in the model to go troubleshoot what's going on in the facility, you know? Um, yeah. so, and it took us a year to really commission that, that building and a lot of the commission was done through m and v adam right so um you know because you, you you design a building you come in and commission it you know from experience yourself and they they commission it on a certain day or a certain week but then they haven't commissioned it for uh you know the seasons and then That's once the even right it's the midpoint yeah. operates so here's here's a thing have you ever considered this I would argue that you're in the data business and actually you're going to evolve into a commissioning business because commissioning is going to become a data-driven algorithm measurement and verification in real-time business. And yeah. there are going to be a few wizards that sit in front of screens who can actually understand what's coming in at them and they're going to be doing these tweaks and writing these algorithms to tune and tune and tune. So it will get to a point where machine learning will say that I think this reheat's been shut off because this is out of whack, this is out of whack, this is whack. And it will send a work order out to go and investigate it without yeah. human intervention. That's where your business, I would argue, is going. Yeah, it is It is now with AirSet. So we have a, a division called AirSet where we have continuous indoor air quality monitoring. And the things that we've seen by from monitoring indoor air quality uh, across the 10 or 12 buildings where we have the sensors is yeah. unbelievable. Like simple things that you wouldn't think of like it uh, ashray has a mandatory dead band of five degrees f between heating and cooling all right uh, yeah, so that, right yeah uh, so which is obviously for energy makes sense you don't want yeah, yeah, yeah. heating and cooling um but what actually happens and this happened in an architect's office um that we were given a presentation in so we're in this office and 40 architects around it's a friday afternoon and the place is disgusting it's horrible like just this horrible smell of like oh it's like just like yeah, the, the the so the ventilation systems weren't on and i was like geez this was really bad so um there's a great little device called a net atmo i bought it in the apple store i have it in my house here um and it's actually advertised as a weather station but it actually has an indoor air quality co2 monitor temperature humidity nice. um, and it has a little we weather station outside you put two triple a batteries into it and hooks up to your iphone or whatever Android and gives you um, outside air weather data and indoor air temperature and uh, humidity and CO2 levels every seven minutes. Um, so it's like 200 bucks to, to buy this device. So we're like, okay, let's slash one of these sensors in this architect's office and find out what's going on and uh, discover that the PPMs were getting up to over 2,400 parts per million what? CO2. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can see this. So this is a CO2. Let me see if I can get the numbers on. I don't know if you can. Hold um, it in front of your face. Let's see, there. Okay, so that's what's in my office. And that's, even that's like outside ambient is like between four and 600, right? So this is actually pretty good. 
2,400. Yeah. So, <laughs> people are like sleeping, man. It's like, holy yeah, shit. yeah it, it's, it's, it's bad, right? And uh, so it was, it was a really, <laughs> so we, now we have the data, which going back to your point. So now we're like, okay, now we know what, okay, it's not just me with my nose. <laughs> it's actually a real problem here, right? <laughs> and so this, these guys had two rooftop units. And so what was actually, I went up the site, looked at the, checked the outside air dampers. I'm sorry, sure. I'm sorry. that explains everything. <laughs> That's not an office, man. That's a hot box. D to D sustained high CO2 levels has zapped everybody's brains. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just like, oh, so for the wow. listeners, the, the, um, the work safe BC limit is a thousand parts per million. So, <laughs> yeah, so. So if, if you're getting complaints, that's that's probably why. So we went, to, we went up to the roof and we checked the outside air damper was open and operating. That wasn't the issue. Uh, so have you any idea, based on what I just said, what was the issue with uh, this architect's office? Why was why do you think it went? The outside air damper was working, was it? Yeah, it was open. Yeah. Fire damper shut. Any guesses? It's to do with the yeah. dead. It was all the dead post, no rare at all. The fan so, wasn't moving. Yeah, what, what actually happened was in the morning it's time, a, the heating is on. All right. So it's less than 20, 21 degrees or 70 degrees out. Yeah. So no problem with CO2. Everything's great. Up until around lunchtime. So what's after happening is all the occupants are in the building. They're heating. 400 BGs per hour, yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. Now, now it's above 21 or 70. But it's not at 75 or 74 yet to kick in the cooling. <laughs> so down. they all go for lunch and come back and they think, oh, geez, okay, it's getting, CO2 is getting a bit hot here. And it must have been that carb lunch that I had, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they had that dead, in between that dead band, the fan on the rooftop yeah, well, yeah. unit was it off because yeah. it's not hot enough to engage heating or not hot enough to engage cooling, but not cold enough to engage heating. Yeah, see, okay, you so dead bad, you know. Yeah, so yeah. And, and that was it. So all we did, we went and bought a Ecobee thermostat, yeah. like a uh, good Canadian company, ripped off the other the thermostat that was there, and then there's a separate uh, programming function in the Ecobee. So you uh, you set the heating and the cooling set points and dead bands, but then the fan does an override. So we just set the fan to run between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday, regardless of temperature. Yeah, 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 and then yeah. CO2. Anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. So that time, was for a, time for a PSA here, public service announcement, okay? So people need to know, like, we're COVID time. So if people are listening to this in the future. This is COVID time, right? So a pandemic, everybody's locked down. People need to know that in North America, probably 85% of all buildings the air quality systems are shut off because of a temperature control. Yep. The thermostat is not an indoor air quality device. It's a temperature device. And what happens is exactly what's going on here, is, Owen, is that the temperature either hits a set point and then shuts the fan down or it's in within a dead band and the fan is off. And so the air quality goes, just takes a nosedive and people don't know why, what's going on. And so here we are in a pandemic and we're telling people to, to ventilate is good. Yeah. They have no clue, no clue, right? No clue, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, to your point there, Robert, like I just looked at a spec there yesterday for a bank and exact same thing, you know. Um, so we have the sensors in the bank right now. We just put them in two weeks ago. So, you know, we looked at the mechanical drawings. I'm like, okay, this is gonna happen because it's cold outside right now. So. Um, the the CO levels our CO two levels are pretty good, but you know, give it yeah. March April where you know we start hitting the balance point of that building uh, and it starts hovering. We're expecting that to kind of take off, right? So, and yeah, we yeah. probably have to do something similar there as well. But and it's not just C CO two; it's like relative humidity is another big one as well. So, um, Adam, you know that the Sibsy guide a eh? environmental design conditions, and you know we're supposed to maintain between forty and seventy percent RH, and we draw that you know rectangle on the psychometric yeah, graph like with the upper. <laughs> yeah. so, so uh the, so one of the one of the biggest things uh, speaking of, of air quality is relative humidity and yeah. um we just do not maintain um humidity levels on the lower side in in any of our most buildings in north america apart from healthcare facilities so and yeah. that's a massive um impact or factor on the spread of pathogens as uh, 
mentioned by good research, Dr. Stephanie Taylor. I don't know yeah, if you've heard of Dr. Yeah, Stephanie Taylor. So she, she presented, uh, I think it was last year, yeah, it was pre-pandemic, last September, uh, or September before actually, um, to, to the BC chapter of ASHRAE and uh, invited some of the healthcare folks along and a fascinating woman and fascinating story that, you know, she's a, she's a doctor MD and then also became an architect, so she really knows. That's the triple threat, threat. <laughs> master, yeah. Ma- yeah. master's degree. Yeah. yeah you, um, so then, so this is an interesting subject because the 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 RH element is is not without controversy, and we know no, that. And, not at all. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know when you look at the members of Reba, for example, versus the members of Ashray, there's a conflict there in terms of the messaging that's going out there. You have people like Stephanie Taylor, uh, who's pushing really strong for it. And, and one of the challenges that we have, of course, in cold climates is elevating that relative humidity can induce yeah. Yeah, and bad building science issues, right? So, but what was interesting is that uh, Professor uh, Lindsay Marr and uh, Julio, or uh, yeah, Julio, I can't remember his name now, I should, I'm going to apologize for this. They did a study with some students down, I think it was in Argentina, and they were actually using RH to uh, provide an indicator of transmission rates of uh of Ooh, COVID. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they were able to make an argument, again, one paper, one area that as RH has changed, the transmission rate changed. And so of course Stephanie Taylor has been you know promoting that paper as she should. Um, but I think you know we these are things that we're learning about. And but again, talk about an integration between the health and the building sciences. RH is that one factor that brings those two together, right? Yeah. So but that's, yeah, that's what uh, Al Gore would call an inconvenient truth. There's been loads of them during this pandemic, right? Yeah. So there's the inconvenient truth. RH matters and we don't really design for it. Yeah. Professional engineers sign off designs and buildings all day, every day that don't meet yeah. ventilation rates. You know, if you've got a VAV system or rooftop unit in America or Canada, there is an 80, 90% chance that thing does not provide the right rent- ventilation at any time. <laughs> Yeah, to, to that point, Adam, the number one email we send out to our mechanical designers that we do energy modelers modeling for is you don't meet code minimum ventilation rates. That is, that is literally, well, it's also, it's also to do with the standard as well. So there's a bit of confusion because LEED has their own version of ASHRAE 62.1 that they refer to. I think it's uh, 20... 2007 or 2017, I can't remember if, which, which, I think it's 2007. And the province and the city of Vancouver here are still using ASHRAE 62, 2001 without a denim in. Oh. Right? So we're using oh. a 20 year old. Uh, no, it, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a good thing. It's actually a good thing because you take an office, for example. So an office, I designed an office at 0.2 CFM a square foot. You mentioned Goran earlier, uh, Adam. So that's where I got that from with Metro yeah. Tower 3 and the other buildings. Right, rules of thumb, Goran. Uh, yeah. and, and the same same with you, Adam. Like you look at the Sibsi Guide A because you, yeah. we look at our, in Sibsi Guide A, it says one person every 10 meters squared for an office at around 10 liters per second. And that works out to be bang on 0.2 yeah. CFM a square foot. Whereas the ASHRAE 2019 62, it's 0.085 oh. CFM a square foot. So it's 40% less air yeah. in the 2019 version of ASHRAE 62 for an office. And if you have someone that's just designing to code minimum, and um, to your point, Adam, and yeah. we've seen this, I was like, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? Where a whole office tower has been designed at one person every you know, 20 meter squared or 200 square feet. Um, and then you got we work that comes in there, so it's a core and shell office. We don't know what the what the, who the, yeah. the we work slice and dice it. Right? We work a slice and dice it, and then all of a sudden, like you've got double the amount of occupants with like half the amount of air. Like there, there's no way they're going to meet. And we actually did these simulations <laughs> because the province were looking at adopting the later versions of ASHRAE, and I, I just how it happened to be working on an office man. I was like, all right, let's just run these three situations and just send them off to from IES and like the PPMs were up at like 1600 PPM oh, CO2 with these minimum codes so it's, and this is code minimum so the ironic part about that is your code minimum doesn't meet work safety limits of 
of a thousand parts per million or six hundred parts per million will have, um, nobody have gets sued, right? If you got uh, sued or lost your license because you didn't meet ventilation, you know what you'd see? Dedicated outside air systems everywhere, and that would yeah. be great. Yeah, yeah. But, um, well, the, even but even some of the office buildings that we went into, these had dough asses at them. And they just undersize it. And yeah. that's one of the bad things about DOAS is that like I think DOAS is a good system, but if you undersize a DOAS, you're in a Stop lot it. of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Where if you have a VAV with reheat, okay, we're gonna tweak the damper a bit. At least we can maintain the ventilation rates. And there's a bit of a get out of jail free card. Uh, but when you don't have uh, when you design that system or undersize that DOAS system, two things happen. A, you can get sued. Your yeah. building is not going to be very healthy. And three, you're minimizing the amount of free cooling you can potentially get as well. Because if yeah. you have like um, VAVs on that DOAS, you can increase those ventilation rates or have demand control ventilation. So the system has the ability to accommodate a WeWork yeah. if, they, if they come in on that floor, but it doesn't necessarily have the energy impact of overventilating the building. That's yeah. kind of where the controls really needs to come in. And that's where design doesn't meet operation because you've got designers who think that okay, I have to design the minimum ventilation for my building because of step code or because of lead or whatever it is. But in reality, they're opening themselves up to a building that's unhealthy getting sued because they think that design is the same as operation and it's not. It's not. So why do yeah, you yeah. have those yeah, controls yeah. in there, you know? Yeah. So those are all landmines. And you know what? Welcome to every freaking high school, every public school on the continent, yes. right? Yes. Every one of them, right? So, okay, so the engineer takes a density design looks at how many yeah. students per square foot and then what's happened over the years is they've increased the density of the students their student teacher ratio and all of those ventilation systems are underperforming in our educational system right so that's so that's number you can take your ashtray book you can take your 62 you're yeah. like i designed this to code you can't yeah. sue me you can't <laughs> <sue> <laughs> i just did what ashtray said this is yeah, the uh, yeah, this, is crazy, this is one right? of my other bet noirs. Persistence of performance. It's the most underrated design criteria ever in a building, right? Yeah. That system needs to perform persistently. So free cooling, I think, is the same as precision bombing. It's a myth, right? I've never met a free cooling system where all the dampers operate properly in the right sequence and been stroked properly. It just doesn't happen. And yeah. even by miracle it was set up properly two or three years later that's not been maintained right yeah. so yeah. you know it's on paper it's great and you do not get sued for that but from a persistence of performance level like a vav system with free cooling economizer and all that the chance of all that working even from day one are very low yeah. <laughs> hey we need to oh, another psa announcement here yeah. um, <laughs> There was, a, there, there was a school in Ontario, and, you know, this is stuff that we need as an industry to, to step up. Uh, so, again, COVID times. There was a carbon uh, monoxide evacuation in a high school in Ontario here uh, this last week. And, and I'm still waiting for the, you know, what happened to that. But what, you know, so people don't, carbon monoxide is a killer, right? So we know that. Why would a school CO system go off unless the building was in a depressurization mode, right? Either, yeah. the, either something was faulty in the control system, which is highly unlikely, or the building went into a depressurization mode. And I, I'm going to bet my last dollar that the school board, due to pandemic, said, okay, we need to ventilate our building, so we're going to run our exhaust systems. And somebody forgot to tell them about the importance of makeup air. And I'm almost my bottom dollar i bet is going is going to go that way we have to you know these opportunities as professionals we have to say listen you guys it's good to ventilate your schools good good to ventilate your buildings but for god's sakes this can kill if you don't do it right so how that's my many, psa sorry yeah, how many yeah i know you're, you're you're right yeah i'm fucking so triggered here how many designers so i work with us corps of engineers lot now they're very prescriptive but boy they do for every building they design they do uh uh, a building airflow balance diagram and they calculate the pressurization and they make that a design consideration. I love that, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you know, a lot of buildings are in the Middle East and if you're sucking in air, that's a bit of a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, how people, many restaurants do you go into, Adam, and there's no makeup air, you know? Oh, like, God. You're oh, trying yeah. to pull the door, you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, we don't need that. 
Yeah, a schematic yeah. and an airflow balance diagram. I love that. If I see that, I know good things have probably been thought about, you know? Those are yeah. sort of red flags for me when I get a set of design drawings and they're not there. Yeah. Yeah, and it depends what stage they're at as well, but it should be at the, you me, I don't know if you remember uh, the brain back in the Cobalt days. Do you remember that? Who's that? It, um, so it was this process flow oh, that we yeah, had. That, yeah. yeah, and so the, the premise was that we, before we start doing any CAD whatsoever, we would have our load counts done, the schematic done, and the control sequence of yeah. operation. Um, I think it lasted for maybe six months. <laughs> I why that didn't work because I think it was Goran said to me, I had a real sort of philosophical debate going with Goran, who should do the sequence and the points list? And Goran was if you know, that's the control guy's job. And my view was, well, you and I come from the UK and Ireland, right? No, that's the designer's job. And yeah. there was this existential schism in the business of like <laughs> where that should be. And it resulted in that, that thing going nowhere, right? Yeah, because it, it, to, to do a control sequence right the way we would have learned in, in university yeah. is it's hard, right? Like, it doesn't matter what building it is. You're talking, clear your calendar, turn off your iTunes, yeah. uh, sit down with your schematic. Put the hood over and, your head. <laughs> and, yeah, literally, yeah, it's kind of like the equivalent of modern day coding. Uh, yeah, and that's literally kind of what it is because you're, yeah, yeah, absolutely you're going through is. each event. Gonna, that's if that, if that, that logic, man. Right? So yep. it's... Uh, it's it's hard and that's kind of where you don't see it it's because it's the only bit of i would say the main bit of engineering that we do as building services engineers is that schematic our loads and the control sequence the rest of the work that is executed by engineers on a day-to-day -day basis as it relates to the building services industry is really technician work like size and pipe size yeah, yeah. and yeah. coordination you know coordinating service coming into the building and um, shaft riser and so forth that is like really the technician part of of yes. the work that we do and uh, the engineering is really the the loads the schematic and the control sequence and to your point adam yeah you see like they'll pawn it off to the controls contractor and what they're going to do is like oh i'll just take it from this job and that's okay <laughs> if you've got that's okay if you've got six teslas because i know everyone kind of compares our also industry that. to the teslas right here's what happens go uh, god don't worry going about you know the designer goes not right, my job. Johnson's, you do it. So Johnson's get get a generic sequence that the designers put out. They go, well, this guy's obviously designed it. He knows what he's doing. And he submits that back to the engineer. The engineer goes, well, obviously, Johnson's know what they're doing. Approved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's definitely something that is still... Yeah. It, it's something that has been consistent, a consistent complaint, even... Um, over the 15 years or 16 years of in, yeah. in the industry it's the same kind of things that that, that don't change and um and they're important right like you can tell when you get a good schematic to your point Adam, oh, yeah. uh, across your desk you know uh that oh yeah someone's thought about this but if they haven't thought about it you know that you're going to encounter problems later on and hopefully the, the usually the energy model does catch these problems like we'll catch chillers undersized coils undersized um Sequence is not working, um, dead bands not implemented, and so on and so forth. So we'll catch a, a good bit of that because we tend to work for the owner and then we get the mechanical drawings in and then give that feedback and we're there to help. But if you don't have that even as a first check, it's just going to get installed and built and you're, you're in trouble then, you know? Yeah. Now listen, we've been going for an hour and a half. See, so your charming Irish lilt has just dragged us in and we... <laughs> right? So... I do want to, so we, we got some rapid fire questions at the end, but I do want to make one point to, to, if you're a sort of an undergrad or a young graduate listening to this, right? Studying your career is actually, it, one reasons we started this thing, right? Yeah, if I want to be an MMA fighter, I model myself on Conor McGregor. So my question to everyone is, who's the Conor McGregor of building services engineers, right? I'd argue it's Peter Simpson, but he's retiring soon, right? Yeah. So it could be you. Actually, could be definitely be you. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I think there's too many good people in the industry like yourself and Robert uh, and uh, among uh, others right, that yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, this, right? at your peak. <laughs> the point is this, right? 
you started as a young graduate, you did your time, you learned your manual calculations, right? You then started, because you're young and you don't know things are meant to be difficult, you start adopting software as part of your toolkit. Yeah. And now you've evolved that into a full integrated design process. And that will probably evolve for you into a commissioning an M and B thing. So you're going to wind up like this Swiss army knife engineer ultimately, right? Who can take something yeah. from con concept to delivery, to operation, to optimization, right? That is the holy circle. That's the goal. Yeah. With the, yeah. with the team. That's kind of what yeah. we're, we're doing right now. Yeah. I would argue, get that Tesla Roadster in order the next one. Yeah, I would argue <laughs> five to ten percent of working in building services engineers will be able to do that in the future. Yeah. Right? So I'm saying if you're listening to this, model yourself on Owen here. Because that is <laughs> the path. That is the career path. When I started, my mentor said to me, Adam, this CADS thing, never gonna catch on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. He was great, Ron Orton. He was awesome, but you know, he just didn't see it coming. So you've really got to look around and see the arc, right? Where? What did Wayne Gretzky say? You got to go where the puck is going to be, right? Yeah, yeah, the exactly. Is integration of this, and you can't not have the basics. You got to have the software skills, the macro look, the micro look, and the whole thing. And I reckon you're one of the people who embody that in where you're going, what you've done. So. Kudos. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate yeah, that. Like, it, yeah. it gives you the confidence as well. Like, to your point about the basics, if you don't have the basics and someone challenges you, so if, I, if I'm in a meeting with you or another, or Robert or another senior mechanical engineer, I'm, I'm presenting software results. If I can't back that up, or if you can't back that up with manual calculations or logic, or this is what's going on, um, you don't feel confidence in the software and your ability to, to make change. And yet in order to make change, you have to convince the people that are actually responsible for the design, the mechanical engineers, that you can trust this advice and the numbers uh, to make those changes. But if you don't have those basics and you just say, oh, that plaster to paste and PV panels are do this, they're going to not trust you. And then they're not going to implement yeah. those things that, that, that you want to implement. So yeah, I think so you're right. It's, a really, it's really important to understand the basics of, building science and controls and HVAC design before you kind of go into energy modeling. And I think that's, you're right. That's what's kind of what's missing in the industry right now. You've got to do your time. There's no shortcut around it. You've got to do your time. You've got to do the grunt work, right? Before you become yeah. the SAS super soldier, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, we've talked it's, before, we've, we've, yeah. We, you know, we've talked before, there's four stages of learning. So you have unconscious incompetence, you have conscious incompetence, and you have conscious con uh, confidence, and then <laughs> unconscious confidence. You don't know what you don't know in the beginning, right? And then you learn some stuff, and then you begin to realize what you don't know. And so you practice, and then you become somewhat competent, and then eventually you just do it because you've learned it. And if you skip any one of those steps, you're screwed. You'll embarrass yourself, you'll get sued. You have to go through the four steps. So... But we are on the, we're getting the end of the time. We, oh, and you know, we could talk to you forever. <laughs> I, know, I, have, you guys. <laughs> I have, I have, yeah, a, you. I have a question for you. Let's just say, you know, like 10 years from now, you get a letter from the Dublin School of Technology and they want you to come back and address their graduating class. What do you tell the students? You're going to have a hell of a career and you're going to make a hell of a difference. And to keep the head down and do the grind work, as you said, to to build your confidence as a, as a person and uh, develop your people skills more. Because one of the things with engineering, uh, I would say, is that we, we tend to be known for lacking in, in people skills. So uh, not not the Irish engineers usually because we're in the public <laughs> line, but, uh, but like the, 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 the people that um, we've worked with and that we work with right now, I'd all go to, to the pub with them and have pints with them. And, you know, I think that that's really a critical thing that is not taught in universities is uh, having those people that you, like yourselves, that you can reach out to that are experts and you can have a good relationship with and are part of your kind of, your clan and that you're on the same page with to, uh, to grow because you can't grow alone. You have to grow and grow with, with good people around you, such as yourselves. 
So yeah, yeah that would be the best bit of advice. I could yeah, give. that's no, that's good <laughs> advice. Yeah, no, yeah. thanks for that answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, my last question is this: then. What's the one thing you would change about our business if you were omnipotent for one day? You woke up, you had your cloak on, you could change anything. What would you change? Yeah, mandatory uh, data reporting and M and B for all business. <laughs> I mean, but with that, I could live under your rule. If that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because if we don't have the data, we can't impact change. That's that would be the number one uh, as it relates to our industry. Yeah. Yeah, that, damn right. That, yeah, that bit yeah. your spot on with that, man. Now, until we pull this data and really find out who's swimming and who's drowning, you don't. We're know. just guessing. We're just guessing, right? So we, don't, we, don't, we don't know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> I've done this design. Well done, me. Well done, me. You know. <laughs> or, 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 to, or to your point about the puck. Well, I think the puck's here. Well, we need to know the puck is going to be there, right? And without that data, we don't know the puck is going to be there, and we don't have a lot of time to mess around with knowing where this puck is and not going to be. So it's important to have that data to know where the puck is going to be. Excellent. Damn right. All right, mate. Well, look, thanks for coming on the show. Owen. Really yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Robertson. Yeah, <laughs> great, great seeing you again, Owen. Take care, man. The Edifice Complex will continue in just a moment. Adam, it's time to thank some people who are on our side. Blue Rhythm Commissioning Software. Blue Rhythm is the commissioning software I've been looking for. Most projects I consult on suffer from poor information and document management. Frankly, it's just chaos out there. Blue Rhythm removes this chaos. It is a secure, always available cloud solution designed to work on any computer, tablet, or smartphone. Their Android and iOS apps allow seamless transition between online and offline work. But what I like most about Blue Rhythm is their painless and fast onboarding process. Their team will bring all your existing forms and checklists into Blue Rhythm for you, or you can use or adapt their pre-built, pre-functional and functional performance test sheet templates. But it's more than that. It enables collaboration, automation, and easy planning and project management for all your projects. Blue Rhythm provides amazing support from a team that really understands your industry. To find out more, go to bluerhythm.com or call country code plus one, 612-460-8305. Also, you can hear from Blue Rhythm President Andy Martin on episode 26 of the Edifice Complex podcast. Robert, Robert, we there yet? I'm bored. <laughs> and I'm, you know, it's hard to believe, but the future has finally arrived in Canada. How's that then? Well, smart remote building and equipment management is now available from Sensor Suite. Go on. Sensor Suite, yep. They're an innovator in smart building technology. We like them. They can monitor, control, and optimize anything in your building, saving you time and energy. You mean Sensor Suite are moving Canadian buildings into the 21st century? Yeah, I know. Another hard thing to believe, but they're doing it and they're saving owners money with efficiency gains. Okay, I'm in. How do I find out more? Got to go to sensorsuite.com or call 1-855-773-6767. And also check out the July 2020 episode of the Edifice Complex podcast and listen to Sensor Suite CEO, Glenn Spry. And now, back to the show. So, Adam, um, that was a, it was a surprise. You know, cause I had been talking to Owen and, of course, you knew him. And then all of a sudden, the triumph of them came together and another... Yeah, just inspiring talk. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you knew him and I, obviously I worked with him, spoiler alert, I used to be his boss, yeah. but, you know, he yeah. was always one of those people who stood out in, in Cobalt Engineering when we were there. He was one of the early embracers of software, but he was different because he was an engineer who knew the design fundamentals. So that made him stand out, right? And that's why he is yeah. where he is, his own business now. But yeah, that was great. You know, if I, when I was younger, a lot younger, and I wasn't sure what my future would look like, you could look at him and say, yeah, that's what I want to be, right? I want yeah. that skill set. I want that design and modeling skill set. I want to be looking at building optimization. I want that whole arc, you know, and there's, and if you want to know how to do it, you can message him and say, you know, what steps did you take? You've only got to look at his LinkedIn profile and say, right, he did this, this, and this, and this, yeah, right? Yeah. Do yeah. that, and you'll have a great career. <laughs> so what's cool about it, so he comes from Dublin. Here yeah. we are, 2021. The three of us are chatting, and he starts talking about Peter Simmons. <laughs> yeah. You know? 
So, you know, you, you, wherever you are, whatever engineering faculty, uh, faculty that you're graduating out of, there's going to be these individuals that you need to pay attention to. Obviously, his Peter Simmons was on his radar screen, and here we are. Like he said, he went, he graduated when in 2005. So here we are yeah. in 2021, and we're talking about an individual that he knows that we know uh, that I met Peter. I, I, we, in fact, we were trying to figure that out the other day. You know, probably over 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. And uh, so, but he's a mat. You know, he, Owen is a master at finding the people that he needs to tweak his career he's been brilliant at it he made i, I mean it's hard to do these podcasts and keep up with the great notes i mean i'm all i got my head down i'm writing that kind of stuff right <laughs> and and part of it is is that you know when you like because you're a master at getting some really good information on that that dialogue that you have with our guests is great and I'm always trying to write down the notes as fast as I can. One of the key things that I got out of there when we were talking about software, because he is, he understands the software, but his big message was is don't trust the software. Yes, thank you. I, I could have kissed him when he said that. Yeah, but, totally. Yeah. You've got to yeah, do that is. check. Now and again, you've got to put your pen up and your calculator and do a check and make sure you're not drinking Kool-Aid. Yeah, totally right. And they... Well, as soon as he said that, that's when Bomber get, you know, hit, hit one, because I was at his dinner table, and we, we were in, the, I, where the hell were we? I think it was in Winnipeg at some conference, and he was one of the speakers, and but he was sitting at our table, and he said, yeah, when I, my students, I just, you don't ever sit down uh, to use the computer until you know the answer. Yeah. And that has always stuck with me, it will always stick with me. Um and then this discussion about performance-based engineering, yeah, you know that that really is, you know, that's the box that we need to open up and crawl into and figure that out because we don't see that. As it, much. it was encouraging for me to see some because to me he's young, right? <laughs> yeah. And to see someone young like that pick that up and run with it because he'll get listened to hopefully by his clients and the people he interacts with. And he's obviously trying to influence a provincial building code. So, you know, if he's successful and people like him are successful, it makes a change. So that's the other thing to take away here, right? If you participate in your career and get into it and get good at it, you also have the opportunity to make a change to things like building code, to the environment, to the clients you work with, right? It's such an impactful job when it's done well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He also made another statement, which again, for our listeners that you really have to have some respect for and that he says, you can do 10,000 simulations in a building. And if you do that, you really don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I wonder how many people are thinking, I just did that. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you have, if you have to do that much number crunching, you don't have the intuition that you need before you should sit down and do those simulations, you know? And when I think back on the buildings that, you know, that I've worked on, had the pleasure to work on, and they weren't fancy buildings, like the stuff that you and Owen have worked on. I mean, the buildings I worked on were grunt buildings. They were the working man's building, you know, the factories and the manufacturing facilities. And then there was the custom homes, but, even still, the modeling that we did, we would look at a set of blueprints and intuitively we knew which parts of the building were going to be a problem. And those were the parts that we did the models on. And we didn't model the whole building because we figured if we could get the bad parts understood, we understood the rest of it. And rarely did we run more than three or four simulations. Yeah. If that, you know, we just, the iterations were, you know, course they weren't you know they weren't the 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 range ability if you will you know the range ability was very coarse as opposed to being very fine you know there's and so when if you look at the design one right now a lot of people it's like an on off switch yeah you do the design you and you turn it on and you walk away but that's in the in in the other end of the spectrum is you've got a dimmer switch yeah with a million with a million places on it and and some of these you know, computer jockeys are doing rangeability designs of one to 10,000, you know, so you, the on switch and then 10,000 places in between. Yeah, I'm sorry, you need something like, you know, a four or five position switch. And if you can't get it 
a handle on the fourth or fifth iteration, you don't know what you're doing. I agree with that. Totally. You know what? I'm actually optimistic about software. Whilst I'm anti-software jockey, because I think the real, the way the software I'm mean, using will hopefully develop is that, yeah, everyone at the moment designs for the peak day right, and the peak load. But really, most buildings operate in the mid-range for 75% right. of the time, right? That's right. Hopefully, as software gets more sophisticated, you can really model that middle and optimize it. You know, and it might make sense to have two chillers instead of one big one. And you can operate one at peak efficiency in winter and mid load, right? There's all these games you can play. And if you can do that in software, once you've got that fundamental basic design done, that's some real value, right? And yeah. then you can justify, so look, if you buy two chillers, big hospital, X, Y, Z, over 25 years, because we'll be operating in this peak efficiency and getting this coefficient of performance, it's actually going to save you operating costs, the money and the energy efficiency and, you know? Yeah. That's my hope for the development of building design software, right? Yeah, what I think, and somehow we got to get uh, um, Mark Paul, I think is his name, from uh, Manitoba Hydro on the yeah. on, or on the podcast. If he's still there, I don't know if he's there or not. But, you know, when they designed that building, the peak, they did, basically did a bin analysis and said, okay, well, like you said, 70% of the – time it's operating at less than peak capacity so their main mechanical plant is heat pumps powered by the power that manitoba hydro generates right large surface area heat exchangers really low temperatures and heating really high temperatures and cooling those heat pumps are just like cranking out exactly what the manufacturer they just step up and down as load goes up and down right exactly and then they looked at okay well so the 30 percent or 25 percent of the peak uh, you know, when you get into the de design conditions, we'll just trim that out with gas fired boilers or, you know, and I, but those suckers rarely ever run, you know, and but you can't do those designs unless you do the numbers and understand what the numbers mean. And I, there's a yeah. huge lesson in that. Um, one of the things that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but I, man, I was just every time we have guests like this and I just like, what's the fuck? <laughs> man, I got questions for you. I got questions for you. One of them had to do with the user factor because there's an there's an international energy agency annex studying the effect yeah. of users on systems. So here we are talking about energy models and mechanical systems and data, all that kinds of stuff. But if we still have to introduce the human factor into it, and maybe even next time we'll get on on back again and we'll talk about the human factors because ultimately, people, regardless of the energy models, people society will run their buildings the way that they want to run them and it's all about reducing stress due to bad indoor environments i don't care what you call it but every unit of energy that's converted from one form to another to condition people it's because they're done being cold they're done being you know too bright loud noisy whatever it's all that's that's what it's all about right so we can sit and we can do modeling all we like, and we can do all the fancy designs all we like, but we really need to understand the human factor. Yeah, it's How a, the human factor is your thing. And the two things that I think are really most underrated, and if you put all these three together, you'd have a great design, is like designing with exergy in mind, right? Using low right. temperature, yeah. but also for persistence of performance, right? right? So how, one of the design questions you should ask yourself as you're developing is, is that straight like what my old example whenever i'm talking in a presentation is triple glazing gives you persistence of performance you can predict the performance of that glazing over a period of time it's pretty right, right? I like and the that, opposite yeah. of that is a vav system <laughs> right so many moving parts god knows where that's going to work because yep. it might not be set up designed or maintained properly yep. so this is why i'm a fan of radiant with doas right assuming it's designed size properly DOS gives you persistence of performance in terms of meeting your ventilation right. rates. It's got to be designed yep. properly, to be fair. Heat recovery as well. But then radiant heating and cooling gives you that local control over temperature, right? Yeah. You know, so that's one big fan of it because there's persistence of performance. There's a predictability that you can model and use, right? Yeah. So, again, anyway, that's me. But the trouble is the industry is so... What happens is R&D is outsourced to manufacturers in our business, right? So manufacturers go, they want to cram as much as they can into one package. So you wind up with a rooftop unit, 
that's trying to do everything for everyone. Everything. And yeah. it winds up doing nothing for anybody. Yeah. And it's dirty. Yeah, it's and a good, a good example of that is everybody, like, I look at my office here, and, and likely in your office area, you've got a printer, a scanner, and there's a good chance it has a fax element to it in it. Yeah. Fax machine still around me because it's a, I, you know what, for me, it's a printer. Yeah, every once in a while I do some scanning, but you know what, it's a, it's a printer, and so it doesn't, it, it's not a great, well, I don't use the fax machine anymore out of it. No. You know, and anyways. Hey, uh, when we're, you know, we were talking about all this kind of stuff, and we've talked about Robert Pettersen before, and yeah. I don't even know if the guy's still alive. But one of the things, he's huh? He's yeah, dead. Yeah, I got to think he is. So for those that his are listening. Book, his book is worth $1,000 on eBay. There you go. You got That book is a, is a legend. Uh. He said... Uh, in one of his classes that I took, and you would have heard the same thing, he said, if you're not prepared to verify the numbers in the field, yeah. why are you doing the math in your office? <laughs> you can't, ar you can't argue with that logic, right? Yeah. We pay engineers and technicians to crunch numbers in engineering offices and offices at the wholesalers and at the mechanical contractors and then they do all they select all the equipment and then it gets all assembled and nobody goes back and verifies that the stuff is happening due to your numbers and in many ways he, he was so far ahead of his time because when Owen was talking about data and the importance of data and the feedback loop well that's what Robert was talking about yeah you know he's talking about the whole loop yeah he was talking about the whole loop and you know that was 40 years ago, you know, 30, 40 yeah. years ago, whenever that book was first written or whenever Robert started teaching. And uh, it's incredibly valuable to have that feedback mechanism. And again, the, the software jockeys don't get that. They, no. you know, they don't get that at all. So it's guys like Owen, guys like you, guys like me, guys like Peter Simmons that, you know, when we go back out to the job uh, and the, this, is the, this is the beauty of commissioning and you're looking at that, damper position and you're measuring airflow and pressures and temperatures and humidity. Okay, here's the numbers, you know, here's what here's what's going on. You know, do these things match? Yeah. It's simple, That's right? It. I paid you to do this. Does yeah. it do this? Yes or no? <laughs> it's very <pretty> simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ultimately when we you know like I mean sometimes you can look at engineering and design and commissioning as a fairly complex process and it is but once you get comfortable with it all and you have some experience under your belt it comes down to if then statements yeah, yeah. it's very it's, when you strip away all the bs things are very simple i they design you to do it does it do it yes or yeah. no it's not it's half doing it it's yeah. yes or no right yeah and i think one of the things maybe you, and i think you'll agree with me on this is that when you develop that knowledge going through those four stages which we talked yeah. about with owen when you get to that fourth stage it can actually it can actually be a double-edged sword because you can start yeah. doing things without thinking about it that's one of the dangers yeah. so i always try to operate my entire career in, in level two and level three so i'm always pushing myself to learn and be alert yeah. right but you know um it allows you when you get to that level which takes several decades you're able to see the macro which drives the direction, but you're also able to see the micro and the impact. Yeah. You know, because the micro, it's like a control system, right? You've got P, you got PI, you got PID, and you can, or on off, right? And a lot of people operate in the on off world, but if you can understand the PPI, PID logic, uh, that's the minutia. It's the, it's the micro tweaking of the systems to make it work. But the ability to see the macro and see how everything operates and make those if then statements is hugely valuable. And that comes from putting in your time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, he was a great guest, actually. I could chat with him for ages. I hope we have to get him back on. Yeah. He might evolve into the next Peter Simmons, right? There is potential for that to happen, I think. I hope so. Yeah. And I hope he's rewarded for it and, and everybody that's with him because he is a leader. Uh, he's taken the steps to learn the stuff, learn the people, learn from the people, uh, stalk them as he has us. And we're, 
we're you know what we like people to stalk us yeah damn right yeah you know, it's just because if we can find those individuals that are young passionate enthusiastic looking for that just that extra step to make things better for themselves the family and the careers of the society that they're part of we love those people damn right damn right that's a good spot to uh, wind up on actually yeah, yeah. so kudos to uh, in Kudos for what he's doing, and I would argue a great example of a career well managed with lots of space to run yet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, keep yeah. your eye on them. Okay. Yeah. Take All care. Right, yeah. See you next time, guys. Cheers, yeah. Bye. You've been listening to the Edifice Complex podcast with Adam Muggleton and Robert Bean. To access show notes for this episode, visit edificecomplexpodcast.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. See you next time.